One, two. Okay, I think it's it's 9 a.m. So I, I don't know if we should start, but we are streaming, so everyone can watch the recording after that. Um, so welcome the big crowd, the audience. Thank you very much for getting up so early on Saturday. Um, and also there is, I think Dan Walsh is having a presentation at, uh, at the same time, so I understand that everyone is there. Um, so my name is Vasek Pavlin, I work for, work for Red Hat for six years, and I would like to tell you something about what we are doing in AICOE with Jupyter Hub on OpenShift. And uh, when I saw my talk on schedule, um, I called it data exploration with Jupyter Hub on OpenShift, and then I realized I, I'm not going to do any data exploration. Um, so I fixed it, and I will call the talk enabling data exploration on, uh, with uh, Jupyter Hub on OpenShift. Um, so what I would like to talk about is uh, how we deploy Jupyter Hub, what are the what are components like the technicalities of the actual platform and tooling, um, and uh, how we integrate it with uh, other uh, parts of the of the platform. So, why do we explore data, and why do we want to do whatever we do in the uh, our, uh, AI Center of Excellence? Um, a smart person, Clive Humby from uh, UK, said that the data is the new oil. Um, it is valuable as it is if you collect a lot of data, but it's, uh, it needs to be refined uh, same way as the oil needs to be refined into plastics and, and uh, gas and, and chemicals and whatever, because without cleaning and transformation and stuff like that, it's just a pile of, pile of bits which you can't really make sense of in most cases because it's too much. and. And, um, and it's, it needs to be clean and stuff like that. The gentleman also came up with uh, the Tesco Club Card, which that might not sound as a lot, but it is a great source of information about customers and what they buy and how they work, so he probably knows his stuff. Um, for being able to work with Jupyter Hub on OpenShift, there are some prerequisites, so let me quickly go through that, and that's one of them is OpenShift. You need to have OpenShift running, uh, which is kind of obvious if you want to deploy there. What is OpenShift? Who doesn't know? What is, who never heard about OpenShift or doesn't know anything about OpenShift? Good. Uh, but quickly for the, for the audience, a big audience on the, on the YouTube, um, it's an enterprise distribution of Kubernetes. It is built on top of Kubernetes, so there are all the, uh, it's, it's a scalable container orchestrator, so if you have anything to do with containers and you want to run them in production, you want to use something like Kubernetes or OpenShift. Um, and then it has all the basic, uh, all the basic concepts as Kubernetes, so things like pod services, deployments, persistent volumes, but it adds more. It adds the, uh, the, the development workflow with builds and image streams and things like that. You can go to okd.io, which is a new, uh, new uh, place where to find information about the upstream version of OpenShift, which, is, uh, which was called OpenShift Origin in the past. The second thing that we, we, we need for the work that we are doing with Jupyter Hub is some object storage. Um, you are probably familiar with AWS uh, S3. Um, we use Ceph, and then Ceph implements the S3 API, so you can use the same libraries like Boto3 in Python or the Hadoop uh, S3 library in Spark um, to access your data in Ceph <coughs> Sorry, uh, with the S3 API. Um, luckily, I, don't have to, I didn't have to set up either OpenShift uh, nor, um, nor Ceph. Uh, everything that I will use here is uh, deployed on MOC, Mass Open Cloud. Um, if you saw Stevens or, Sher or Sherard or whoever was talking yesterday uh, about MOC, um, we are working with them on something called Open Data Hub. So this is part of the Open Data Hub um, and um, we are deployed there. So what are the tools that we will be using for the data exploration uh, that we are not going to do? Um, the first, and the, like, the core part, is Jupyter. You can run Jupyter, server, Jupyter notebooks uh, on your laptop, and you can use that. It looks like that, basically. So you have some, it's split into cells, and the cells can be either some kind of markdown, or uh, it can be code, or it can be output of the code. And then you, as a user, type something into your web browser. It's a web application that has a backend uh, 
and uh, you type something in a web browser, and the commands, the code is sent to the Jupyter kernel. The kernels, there are plenty of them. Uh, you can find them on GitHub. Uh, and there is Python, Scala, C I even saw C Sharp. Uh, R is pretty popular. And then it sends output back to the Jupyter UI, and you see that uh, in, in, in your web UI of Jupyter. Um, the good thing is that the, the actual file is just a JSON. So if you want to do something fancy with the content, you can take the JSON and parse it and, and work with that. Um, or you can view it in the, uh, in the Jupyter Notebook um, UI and, and, and actually run code and stuff like that. What builds on top of that is something called Jupyter Hub. And that basically the change is that the Jupyter notebooks themselves are a single user. You as a user run them on your laptop and you can write the code and you can see, see the stuff. But if you want to provide that capability um, in a distributed way to like a team of people in your company or at school, I think it's like for universities it might be super inter interesting or even high schools. Like if you want to start coding in Python, you can provide these notebooks and you can provide the Jupyter Hub uh, to the, to the um, class and, uh, and they can just go in and they, Jupyter Hub will automatically, when they log in, it will spawn up a uh, Jupyter notebook for them and they can work with that. And it spawns and manages those notes, notebooks so that a user always gets to a, his own persistent version of the notebooks that he work, was working with. And the last part of the system would be uh, Apache Spark. I assume that you are probably all familiar at least uh, slightly with, the, with Apache Spark. Uh, as the website says, it's a unified analytics engine for large scale data processing. So that means that if you want to process some data, uh, you want to do some cleaning and you want to do some model training and something, you would use Spark. It provides APIs and libraries like Spark SQL uh, and machine, uh, MLlib, machine learning library, which has implemented plenty of um, algorithms. And it works in a uh, cluster mode, so you have master and workers, and uh, workers do the work and master orchestrates them. And we will use uh, Jupyter Notebook to connect to Spark and do the processing in Spark so that the notebook or the, the, the uh, Jupyter server doesn't have to be that beefy and, and work with so much data. So I have a quick demo. It is, um, it is nothing fancy, but um, basically just walk through of how that works, uh, how, how the Jupyter Hub works. Um, so this is, I have OpenShift, I have Jupyter Hub deployed, so I go to the URL that OpenShift generated for me, and I will sign in with my OpenShift credentials. Um, that is quite, a, quite uh, important because um, if, if I don't, I don't want to remember another credentials. I want to use something that I already know. I'll get back to that uh, uh, later, how that is solved in Jupyter Hub. Now we select uh, from the list of images. I want to use Spark, so I will select this Spark image. Um, and these are basically just what you would, if you, if you install Jupyter notebook server on your local machine uh, or your laptop, um, these images basically represent your laptop and uh, installed dependencies. So if you want to use Spark and PySpark, you would need some configuration and PySpark installed and Java installed on your laptop. And the same way it works with this, um, with this notebooks that the image contains all the dependencies that are needed. Um, so I have these two notebooks. One I called Boto because I use Boto Free Library, which is a library that implements S3 API. So I have my credentials in environment variables. I'll, I'll show you how I got them there. And uh, I, will, I connect to some endpoint. Uh, and so I can run this, right? So it installs the dependency if it's missing. Um, and I'll connect. And then I can list buckets. Uh, if you saw the um, Open Data Hub presentation yesterday, you saw Stephen to create the, his bucket here. So we are on the same uh, endpoint. So I see his bucket and uh, I created mine here. So he could see my data there. Um, and then I have this other one, which I actually just downloaded from internet. I looked for PySpark Jupyter Notebook, and I got to this repository. Uh, 
which someone created. I, I don't know the gentleman. Um, and he has couple, so I just took the last one, I think, because I thought that, that that is going to be the coolest one, probably. And I had to fix some stuff because he was writing it for Python 2 and we are running Python 3, but uh, it was mostly just a syntax fixing. Um, and what it does is that it's again connects to, connects to S3, connects to Spark. See, I have this Spark cluster URL in my environment. And then it uh, downloads some data from the, from the uh, object storage, which I pre-uploaded there. And then it does some uh, decision tree um, building and decision tree, tra decision tree training. And let me run that, run all below. Um, and it validates whether the decision tree was a good one. It uses data, data set from KDD cap, which was some um, uh, network intrusion detection uh, competition. So uh, build a classifier for network intrusion detection. And uh, so that, that uses the same data set, yeah. Um, so it's now connecting to Spark. And uh, for the Spark, we can look here into OpenShift that it's running as part of my namespace. Uh, as part of the Jupyter Hub namespace, I have two workers, um, and I have created a route so that we can look into the. We can't look into that because it doesn't have. Let me fix that quickly. Um, come on. Uh, okay, so let, let's not fix that. Um, so what you would see here, let me try a different thing. Let me start Firefox. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So what we see here is that we have um, two worker nodes. Um, each each um, executor gets 20 gigabytes of RAM and eight cores. Um, well, eight cores is together, so each executor gets four. And then that's where we are actually running the, um, the notebook code. Um, so it downloaded the data, and uh, now it's, uh, it's processing the data, splitting the CSV um, into multiple, and then it will be, then it will be training the decision tree. Um, what do we have in OpenShift, as I, as I mentioned, we have the Jupyter Hub, and we have now my own Jupyter server, which Jupyter Hub is routing to, and we have the Spark, uh, Spark cluster. So I'll, I'll let it run. It will take some time. The training it takes like, I don't know, eight minutes. So I'll go back to presentation and, uh, uh, and then we can, we can revisit that. So, about the architecture of Jupyter Hub. Um, basically, the entry point where you access to as a user is uh, Jupyter Proxy, which then routes either to Jupyter Hub API or at your server that you started. And then there is something called Spawner, which takes care of spawning those notebooks or those servers per user. Uh, we use Cube Spawner, um, as the name suggests. It is a spawner that is working with Kubernetes, and it generates the pod definition and uh, submits it to OpenShift. There is also a database which gets it's just uh, for tracking of users and started notebooks and things like that, so that it doesn't um, and then the proxy routes and things like that, so it doesn't uh, disappear. Uh, when there is some restart or something. So how it works, as you saw, a user comes to Jupyter Hub and 
then it's redirected to the, some authentication. There are multiple implementations of authentication for Jupyter Hub. You can have GitHub authentication, you can have um, Kerberos, um, you can have um, a pre-generated set of users and passwords. So if you, we, when we were doing some demos, uh, we just generated 20 users and then gave, gave the uh, attendees for the workshop those users and passwords. Um, then when, you, when, when the server is spawned, so the user requests the server to be spawned. JupyterHub generates, um, generates the artifacts for OpenShift. And if, there is, uh, if it finds that uh, I want to start a Spark notebook, it also generates a, a config map for Spark operator. I will explain, explain what Spark operator is later. But basically, um, it takes care of the Spark clusters. Um, so OpenShift starts at my Jupyter server and uh, notifies the operator about the requested Spark cluster, and the Spark cluster is started, and then the user <coughs> and then the user accesses his notebook and connects to Spark. And when he stops the server, um, it also kills the cluster. Um, we use APB, Ansible Playbook Bundle. Um, you can learn about that from the documentation uh, of OpenShift. But basically, it's just a, it's just a set of uh, artifacts for OpenShift about how to deploy each service and how they should work together. Um, and um, you can have that in a catalog in OpenShift and nicely deployed it by free clicks or something like that. Um, so that um, APB source code can be found in the opendatahub.io, and we have, uh, we have it built in Quai.io uh, under the organization Open Data Hub. Uh, so we can go there, and you can download the image and deploy it to your OpenShift and, and try it, try it uh, yourself. So what is special about our Jupyter Hub? Because this, what you could do, basically I build my work on top of work of uh, Graham Dampleton, who has, uh, I have link at the end, but he has Jupyter Hub uh, Jupyter Hub on OpenShift or Jupyter Hub Quick Start, something like that. And I, I just took that and built something on top of that. And what are the differences basically are mainly these four things. So image auto discovery, single user profiles, ephemeral clusters, and the publish and share. Uh, what, did mean, what does it mean? So you saw that select box uh, for the images that is automatically generated from the uh, notebooks that are built in OpenShift, from the images that are built in OpenShift. Um, it is not very nice right now. The user experience is not very good, but I'm planning on improving that with some descriptions and uh, like uh, install dependencies and things like that. So it's, it's, uh, it provides more information uh, to the user. Um, but it's, it's helpful if you, you don't have to know, you don't have to remember, you just pick from the, from the select box. The single user profiles, uh, we quite quickly, when we started to use JupyterHub, we realized that uh, every sub-team in our team and every image has to have different configuration. Like, um, if you are working with um, some Parquet file that you download from object storage and you don't use Spark because you just want to process it directly in the notebook, uh, you might need uh, more, more uh, memory for the notebook. If you are working with Spark, then you don't need that much memory, uh, but you need Spark deployed. If you are working with uh, some uh, specific object storage um, uh, endpoint or bucket, you might need to have that in your environment variables. So um, we build this uh, library that basically is configured with a config map in OpenShift right now, and you can uh, mix and match the images that are that are used and the usernames and users with like what should happen when the user selects that image and how it should be configured. Um, you saw that I, I had that Spark cluster. Inside, um, inside my uh, namespace, and uh, that works. It's called Spark Operator, and uh, operators are a concept in Kubernetes and OpenShift that there is a service, the operator, which listens on events, and if it finds some specific event, it will react to it. So here, a user comes and says, "Please, operator, ferry, can I get, uh, can I get a Spark?" And uh, it says, yes, sure, you can get a Spark, and it deploys Spark based on the configuration. And when the user leaves and says, I don't need a Spark anymore, so it removes the config map or the custom resource, it will delete the Spark uh, cluster again. So we have that uh, in, the, in the profiles that we say that if you select the Spark image, uh, we want to instrument the uh, Spark operator about that 
configuration of the Spark image and say, please deploy two workers uh, and one master with these resource limits for us. Um, yeah, and the, last, and the last bit is basically um, what we hit also quite early, the workflow um, about, <coughs> sorry, uh, the workflow about uh, how do you share your notebooks? Because if you have Jupyter Hub and you want to, I don't know, I want to give Sherard uh, my notebook, I have to download it, I have to send it over email or push it to Git, and then he needs to download it and upload it to, upload it to his uh, Jupyter notebook, uh, to his Jupyter Hub, sorry. Um, which is not very nice if I just want to show him a simple change in like line 24, I change this letter and now it works. Um, so I, I build a plugin for Jupyter Hub where you click a button, um, where you click a button, um, you give you give it some name. Uh, no, here you give it some name, yeah. and you hit publish, and you, you get a URL which you can access, and you get an NB viewer. Uh, NB Viewer is a tool that lets you view the notebooks without being able to execute anything, so it's read-only, but it renders the notebook in a basically the same way as the Jupyter Hub. And this, uh, this uh, URL you can share if it's, if it's public, it's not uh, behind the authentication, so you can share it with anyone. And then uh, he can just view, and uh, he can also download the notebook. Um, so that, that I think helped us a lot. Um, to speed up the speed up the process. So, how is our training going? So we saw that we see that the decision tree classifier um, got trained. This is the decision tree. So there is a lot of if and else statements, and now it's doing something else. Um, so I I didn't really dig deep into this notebook. I just wanted to show that basically with uh, our deployment we can directly use Spark and, um, and uh, the ML libraries without having to do many changes to the notebook that I found randomly on the internet so that the integration is, is really good. Um, so what else? Um, yeah, so I just wanted to um, go over a couple ideas that I have about like next steps for the for the Jupyter Hub that we could do. So we right now have this Spark operator integrated, uh, but I've, it seems that the Dusk. I don't know if you heard about Dusk. It's a Python-based um, distributed analytics engine or, or whatever uh, you would call it. Um, Provides advanced parallelism for analytics, enabling performance at scale for tools you love. Uh, so it's basically it seems like Spark implemented in Python, supporting Python better than Spark, maybe. Um, so um, we are thinking about like adding that next to the Spark operator, having a Dusk operator, which would then spawn, spawn Dusk cluster if users wants that. Um, if you if you noticed in my notebook, I have. I have these uh, environment variables uh, with, um, with credentials. Um, they are not there automatically, but I would like to have them there automatically uh, populated for users based on some secrets somewhere. Um, I have to add them in the single user profiles config map. Um, so I would like to have that as an as a automated way how to get those credentials from some source of truth and, and push them into the server automatically so that the user doesn't have to care about that. Um, I would like to work on GitHub and GitLab integration so you can have a button same as the publish one. I would like to push this to my Git repo or I want, I want to create a Git repo for this notebook or something like that. Um, I've seen some attempts on the internet that people were doing that but it, it never really worked. Uh, in a user-friendly way. Um, you saw that select box, which was pretty ugly for the images, so I'd like to make that more fancy, and more, more uh, user-friendly, and make um, users, uh, make it more useful for users. 
And also Jupyter Hub exposes metrics. So if you want to know how many requests, how many users and things like that, and maybe build some alerting on top of that, like my cluster is getting full because I have too many users using Jupyter Hub at the same time. Uh, but I, I, we need to uh, enable, well, I think they are enabled, but we, I'm not sure what is exactly in there. And uh, we don't have uh, Prometheus watching that, so we need to set that up also for the uh, Jupyter Hub APB and probably ins extend the metrics because as we start using the Spark and the connection between Jupyter Hub and Spark, we need to be able to map it together um, in the metrics. And and that's basically that's basically everything I had. These are some useful links. So this is the APB. Uh, this is the link for the um, for the single user profiles, which is a quite simple library uh, just for that one use case. Um, here are the uh, OpenShift configuration for the Jupyter Hub, which is then used in the APB. Spark operator, a colleague from Red Analytics IO, uh, Red Analytics team in Red Hat was working on, on the Spark operator um, so that uh, I just used it um, and it worked perfectly. And this is where we came from with the Jupyter Hub, the Jupyter Hub on OpenShift, uh, which Graham Dempleton, put, uh, Graham Dempleton put together. And um, you can go there and you can try Jupyter Hub without all these sparks and things like that, just um, on OpenShift in a simplest in a simplest form. Um, yeah, so that's that's basically it. Any questions? Yes, sure. Um, yeah, so the question is whether with the Spark operator we get, uh, we have one shared cluster or if we have cluster for users. Um, I, yeah, I didn't mention that. So we are basically thinking whether we should deploy one big BFA cluster for Spark and then let everyone connect to it. But it has uh, its uh, issues and limitations like that you have to reserve that capacity on your OpenShift cluster. Like if you want to really have a uh, hundred users and you would you want to allow them, all of them at the same time, go to that cluster, then you need to have reserved hundreds of gigabytes of RAM for those, for those workers. Or you can have ephemeral clusters, so when the user comes and logs in and starts the server, it will start a Spark for him, and when he goes away, it will kill the Spark cluster for, uh, for uh, his spark, spark cluster. So we are doing the ephemeral clusters right now. So when the user comes, he gets his own uh, fresh, clean Spark cluster with some resource limits, which are obviously tighter than if it would be one big cluster and he would be the only one there. Uh, but. Uh, we need to do some performance testing and uh, and uh, get some more data about like how, how that actually works and if it's if it's useful for people. Startup times for what? Um, the Spark cluster it's it's quite fast. Um, basically, I can I can probably show you. So I'll I'll kill my cluster. Uh, I, I will stop my Jupyter server. Um, I think it's well. It's basically a couple, couple seconds, or maybe maybe a couple of tens of seconds. Why can I close that? Ah, great. So once the Jupyter notebook uh, server disappears, which should be any seconds now, um, but it uh, has to wait for the timeout because there are no. Um, Shut down scripts in that in that uh, image. That's also one thing that we need to fix. Um, so when it goes down, the the Spark cluster will disappear as well, and then I can start again. So in the meantime, we can take probably another question or two if there are any. Yes. So where's your data kept? Yes. I, I, where's your data kept? I have an HDFS cluster. Uh, so we have the, we have the Ceph cluster backing the backing the OpenShift, and um, the Ceph the Ceph cluster is basically where we push and pull data from. Okay, so I could just connect my Hadoop cluster. Yeah, the yeah. Same way. Oh. It doesn't it doesn't really matter uh, like what technology you choose for that. Um, so it's it's gone. So I'll just go here. I click start my server. I will pick the Spark, and I'll go back here. And you'll see that my Jupyter notebook is starting, and basically immediately I got the two workers running, 
uh, and the master node takes a bit of time because it needs to connect to the workers and uh, figure that out. It uh, depends on like if you are starting it for the first time, there, are, there is some time that needs to, uh, that, that uh, the images, the, the container images takes to download uh, on the node. Uh, but if it's like the second start, and the, the images are, are same for all, uh, every user, so once they are downloaded on the a node, it is basically instantaneous um, start. Um, I, I don't know what it, why the uh, master takes so long now. But I think that it's, it's running, it's fine. It just didn't update the UI. Yeah, so it was basically instantaneous start. Yes? The, 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 the notebook sp spawner, does it scale up to multiple nodes or do you have to configure that for just on the Jupyter Hub? Yeah, so, this, so the spawner, uh, the spawner um, is not doing anything smart. It just generates the pod definition and pushes it to OpenShift, and OpenShift schedules the pod. Um, so uh, that basically means that as is the, it's up to the OpenShift scheduler to, to schedule these. So it would, it would distribute them across the cluster. It wouldn't put them on a single node. Uh, depending on the size and, uh, and load on the cluster. Um, I don't know the details of implementation of the OpenShift scheduler, but um, yeah, it is, it, is, it is based on the OpenShift scheduling, so it would be distributed. And the same, same goes for the, uh, for the Spark. It doesn't have, uh, we could configure it in a way that it would have some affinity, so like uh, get, put my Jupyter Hub close to the Spark, but it doesn't really um, bring anything because we are try to we are trying to pull the data from the Ceph or S3 or something, not from not not sending it from the ser notebook server. I think there was some other question. Yes. How much is the Spark operator? How mature is the Spark operator? Yeah. Um, it is it is quite new. I think it's like a couple of weeks old. Uh, but uh, honestly, there is not, I mean, there is missing, I, I, and I still miss that, I've already filed a couple of feature requests, I'm missing some configuration options, like um, at the beginning there was, there was no, another way how to set uh, limits, um, resource limits for the, for the workers and for the master and stuff like that, so that's there now, uh, and I have a couple more feature requests uh, in queue for like, um, I want to be able to force update the images and I want to be uh, able to configure these values and stuff like that. But generally the working of like spawning and killing the cluster, um, it's, it's working very well. I haven't, I haven't had an issue with that. Uh, the, the guy, Jirka uh, Kremser, who works on the Spark operator, he actually built a library in, in Java. Um, uh, I think it's, he calls it JVM operators, uh, which is like a library that you could use to build d uh, another operators. So uh, he's trying to get that uh, very stable, and then uh, Spark operator would directly benefit from that. Okay, I think we are out of time anyway. We have one more minute. Okay, so if there is... There's a quick Any question. other question? No. Let's okay. hear it for our speaker. Thank you very much. <laughs> and enjoy the rest of the conference, obviously.